Okay, why don't we get started? Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, before I jump into any prepared content, are there any questions? Any questions about HDF5 issues someone might have or um, something you don't understand in the documentation or anything? No? Okay. Then I'll, I'll just jump right in and feel free to interrupt me at any time. Okay, so this is um, about uh, a, a new way of presenting an HDF5 tutorial, and we have had many occasions and instances of that in the past, but I think uh, this all came to a head at last year's HUG event, the HDF user group meeting that we had in Ohio, at Ohio State, and uh, we got a lot of helpful feedback. And um, I think we uh, sat on that for a while, but it ultimately crystallized into this format that I would like to show you today. I'm, uh, I wouldn't insist on that the content is necessarily um, as good as it can be or nowhere near as it could be, uh, but that's where I'm looking for uh, help from the community as far as the content goes. But um, I would claim that uh, the format in which we have organized the material here um, is actually um, a good format in the sense that um, the, the material that we're going to look at here in a moment, you can uh, um, look at that material on your own time. You could do that also in a sort of classroom or course setting. And it's very interactive because we'll, we'll be using Jupyter Notebooks that I think nowadays um, a majority of users uh, is familiar with. And um, it also requires no installation. So I will show you um, how this tutorial can be um, sort of... Um, uh, exercised um, in a web browser. You don't need anything uh, else installed. The only thing you need is a GitHub account, but that maybe is not a, a too big of an ask. And uh, yeah, let's jump right into it. So uh, the GitHub repo is github.com hdf group hdf5 tutorial. And um, there is a little bit um, of an explanation here. Um, about HDF5, about the hopefully growing uh, collection of Jupyter Notebooks in here, and then um, how to get started. And the underlying technology this uses um, are so-called GitHub code spaces, which sounds grand. Uh, think of it as Docker containers. So as part of GitHub, um, we know that we have um, Git, uh, the version control system. We have a test infrastructure with GitHub Actions and so forth. But at some point, uh, GitHub introduced this concept of code spaces, Docker containers, um, that you can configure and you can actually embed into a repository a, a predefined configuration for such a Docker container so that someone who wants to perhaps contribute to your project, or in this case, um, exercise these Jupyter Notebooks, uh, they don't have to install anything. They can just instantiate one of these containers and then are on their way. And so uh, down here, and this is maybe a little bit of a glitch, you have to scroll down here. There is a banner here that says, open in GitHub code spaces. So let's do that. When I click on that, um, it presents me with um, certain options that I can choose. Um, you can pick a repository, but in this case, this is the repository that I want, but I could also instantiate a code space with a completely different repository. I want the main branch. Um, there is um, a predefined configuration called HDF5 tutorial, and as you might uh, be used to from other sort of cloud uh, providers. Uh, they have these different availability regions, and I think GitHub has a few, two in the US, one in Europe, uh, uh, two in Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, and Australia. And you can pick a machine type, so I'm going to pick uh, uh, to maybe speed things up a little bit. I, it would be fine with two cores, so we are not 
sort of taxing uh, this infrastructure here, but just for argument's sake, I'm going to use a four core. And then you say create code space. And what this does is instantiate um, this uh, pre-built Docker image. And uh, for those of you who use Visual Studio Code, um, basically um, instantiate um, Visual Studio Code in your browser because it's uh, based on JavaScript, Node.js. And so this gives me a VS Code interface. And in a moment, um, right now, it's loading certain uh, VS Code extensions. Um, there, there, there is a number of extensions um, that is helpful uh, to go through this tutorial. So for example, in a moment, we would like to visualize HDF5 files or look at HDF5 files. And as many of you know, uh, there is this great um, community contribution called um, H5Web. And H5Web uh, from ESRF, the uh, Synchrotron in Europe, um, they have packaged this H5Web um, uh, uh, plugin uh, as a Visual Studio Code plugin and so um, and a bunch of other extensions are being loaded so if you are familiar with the vs code interface or maybe you're not familiar uh, since it is really a development environment a full-blown development environment for example down here you will see a bash shell we are probably not going to do anything with that bash shell but over here you have a file explorer you can search for things since this is connected to github um, we could be doing version control type activities. Uh, we can do debugging, but here's, for example, extensions. And you can see we pre-installed a few extensions, C, C++. Some of them, since I'm logged in uh, in my uh, own GitHub account, I have other extensions that I use, such as GitHub Copilot and so forth. But you see uh, Jupyter. Uh, Markdown, Lint, uh, Python extensions, and so forth. So a few of these get uh, pre-installed by default. And then here you see um, we have the contents of that GitHub repository. And the tutorial begins at the beginning. So we thought, and again, I make no claim that this is the perfect way of presenting this. Um, but I thought um, there is a good chance that uh, perhaps uh, many of the users that would come to this tutorial um, come perhaps more from the, the Python side or the R side and so forth. They may ne never have written a C program. And uh, so um, this is maybe an opportunity to quickly show them um, what a simple C program looks like and how it works and uh, just run it and kick the tires, so to speak. So um, if you are, in, of course, we assume that uh, people know how to run Jupyter Notebooks, um, uh, but, but yeah, we might uh, add a little bit of documentation as well. So what you would do here is there, there, there is a pre-installed uh, kernel so it would be a Python environment. And then there is a Conda environment uh, called HDF5 tutorial. So I hope that's reasonably self-explanatory. And, um, and then we can just come here and um, uh, execute these notebooks. So for example, um, in this uh, C example, we are just creating a simple C program. And then we are compiling and running it. So this is a simple C program. Uh, that basically accepts and echoes arguments, uh, or if no arguments were provided, it will just print no arguments. And But that's the beauty of these uh, Jupyter Notebooks, that um, they can be evaluated and changed uh, dynamically. And then we have a little bit of a commentary here, so we want to gently introduce, okay, uh, now you would like to do something with HDF5. Um, you have to include header files, and this is a simple C program that would just echo uh, the library version, for example. And uh, so if we compile and run this program, it turns out in this case, um, it's, it's a little outdated version, uh, HDF5 library 1.10.6, but that's okay. Uh, and for this notebook and many of the other notebooks, it's not really necessary to have the latest and greatest library version. Uh, and then uh, just for kicks, um, 
uh, int we introduced a simple C++ program. So what would this look like in C++, albeit uh, we are using the C API here and just compile and run. And um, then there is a little bit of a summary here and uh, just saying, hey, if C, C++ is not your thing, there are some other goodies um, in this tutorial as well. And then, so this is kind of a warm up uh, just to uh, tell people, well, some of this is going to be in C, C++, although there's plenty of Python. And then the tutorial start, really starts here. And again, I'm gonna say it one more time. Um, I make no claim that this is the perfect example um, to, and the simplest example to um, uh, have sort of as the running thread throughout this tutorial. But what we are doing here as our model problem, we are saying, hey, let's assume we have something that looks like time series. And um, we would like to record a bunch of these time series. And um, the easiest way to perhaps store that in HDF5 would be to create a two-dimensional data set or a two-dimensional array where um, the rows, each row represents a different time series and the columns represent sort of time steps. And uh, that should be a reasonably simple example, but then again, someone might have a better idea uh, for, for such a model problem. And then the beauty of this is, since this is now in GitHub, um, everybody can create a pull request. So I hope um, I had already input, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, um, from uh, community contributors, um, the creator of HDFQL and the creator of Pure HDF, they helped me uh, put together these uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, for their respective uh, bindings. And uh, that was a great experience. And, and I hope yeah, someone more creative um, has a better idea and then we can um, yeah, change this and have something that is even simpler and even more intuitive. So um, in this case, we start with C and or C++ and um, we would like to create uh, sample paths and uh, these sample paths in this case we, we use as certain type of stochastic process that has certain parameters. And um, we can just go ahead and, uh, oh, uh, we have to pick a kernel. So I'm being prompted here. You can see that at the top uh, to pick a kernel. If you haven't picked a kernel, that's the beauty of it. It will prompt you. And then uh, we use a random number generator and then a simple stepping algorithm to create these trajectories. And the first thing would be, even before we talk about HDF5, it's a perfectly legitimate question to ask, especially in the context of a tutorial to say, hey, why don't I write all these as text files? Why, why bother with these two dimensional arrays and so forth? So what, what would this look like? Well, here is a simple example that just takes uh, these sample paths or time series, whatever you want to call them. And let's just write them to a text file called ouprocess.txt. And uh, this is what this uh, program does and in, in a compiled language. Okay, we compile and run it and good. So here's our, if I double click this, this is our uh, text file. And that's what it is, great. Uh, we have one line for each uh, path, and then we just get a bunch of numbers and okay. Um, likewise, you could say, okay, I can see your point that maybe for long uh, time periods or large numbers of trajectories or both, uh, perhaps the whole text thing is a little verbose and, and uh, maybe not ideal. So what about writing binary files, just unformatted binary? And here's a simple example how you would do that in C++. So you would just do unformatted binary output and pretty much store the same thing. Um, store at the top sort of the parameters, the metadata and double quotes, the number of paths that we generate, the number of time steps that we take, the increments in sort of physical time units, and then the um, sort of the drift, the uh, the average and the volatility, and then just this um, 
large array of numbers. And okay, we can do that. And then of course, yeah, we can compile and run this program and that gives us a binary file here. No point in really opening that, but that's what it is. And then we sort of switch gears and say, okay, how would we do this in HDF5? Of course, as part of the tutorial, we would try to talk about sort of what are the pros and cons and the challenges and the advantages of one versus the other. And But today I'm just introducing the tutorial. I'm not uh, giving the tutorial. And so for HDF5, we just have an auxiliary function here. We want to store the things the drift, um, the average, and the volatility, and so forth as attributes, as HDF5 attributes. And so we are just creating a little helper function um, that would store these um, uh, attributes. Uh, and then we also want to include, I mean, we tried to make this a little fancy here. We include a link, for example, to the, uh, the Wikipedia entry for this particular stochastic process where you can read more about it. And then in all its glory, here is the uh, C++ program that writes um, this whole uh, uh, two-dimensional two array plus the decorations um, to an HDF5 file. You see here, for example, we add, uh, it's, it should be, be called add attribute. Uh, so we create an attribute to the root group called source um, that points to the GitHub tutorial just to make it a little more self-descriptive. Then we add an attribute we call comment and add uh, a comment. Likewise, this Wikipedia entry and then some indication how to interpret in this two-dimensional array the rows and columns. And that's all cool. And then again, this is not the time to go into great detail here. We can also do things like Unicode characters. So the thetas, the mu's, the sigmas, and all the rest of it. And um, then we can execute that. And then you see here's our HDF5 file. And now it's sort of the ecosystem kicks in. If I click on that, it loads the H5 web extension and I can actually look at this HDF5 file. So this is the root group. You see it has this attribute. And then I can look at the data set itself. And you see it's, in this case, 100 by 1,000. And uh, here are the attributes. You see all the other parameters, so to speak, are here. And then we can actually look at these trajectories. So by default, uh, it shows tries to show us a two-dimensional a, a two array. But if I pick the line plot, yeah, these are these trajectories. And then I can sort of uh, cycle through. Um, if I want to see a particular trajectory, there's a total of 100. And, but yeah, they look as what we saw earlier uh, in this uh, picture from uh, Wikipedia. Nice. OK. And then, of course, so this is the visualization part. And here's just a screenshot. But then, of course, we can do things like if I want to visualize this uh, sort of with a matplotlib or something like that, um, I can do that. I can just uh, look at a specific trajectory and then use matplotlib uh, to do my plotting and so forth. That's cool. And then, of course, the first question is, well, Python users at this point will already be pretty desperate and will say, well, I can do this. This program looks much, much simpler in Python, and it does. And here's what it looks like. I actually created that with ChatGPT. So I gave ChatGPT the C++ version and said, hey, can you give me a, a Python version of this? And sure enough, however, of course, the this is not very idiomatic Python and so forth, but uh, it's good enough for this example. And then, hey, if a community member sort of has a very concise or succinct way of writing this down in idiomatic Python, create a PR. Finally, there is a little bit of a discussion down here uh, that talks about um, uh, now, let's assume in the light of our discussion about text versus binary versus HDF5, you're saying, okay, I'm sold um, on HDF5. Sort of what are the kinds of considerations, the types of questions you should ask yourself? And there is a little bit of a discussion here about, around licensing and costs and compatibility integration and so forth. So I'm not giving that tutorial here. 
uh, you're welcome to explore that on your own. So this is sort of the the introduction um, to the of the theme of this two-dimensional array that will accompany us uh, throughout the entire tutorial. And then we are sort of looking at variations and I'm not going uh, into great detail here. So for example, one variation could be, you could say, okay, a two dimensional array where you have a number of these time series and they all have the number of time steps, that's kind of easy. And uh, what about, I don't have enough memory to keep all of this in memory and I have to create and write this incrementally how would I do this? And uh, here's an example notebook that shows you how you would do this. And then uh, variation two, you say, okay, I wanna take the next level up. Uh, I would like to do this in parallel because obviously in this case, um, all these uh, trajectories could be produced independently. And here's how you would do that. You would have to think about partitioning, passing arguments and um, it's all good stuff, and then you just do it. So um, uh, then, and and I think this is uh, so important for me, I think what this tutorial should convey is also this idea of the, uh, the breadth of the HDF5 ecosystem, and certainly the highly scalable data service HSDS uh, is part of that. And um, we have it actually pre-installed in this Docker container. And uh, I'm just going to quickly run through here to show um, how, you, how people who think they need a Kubernetes cluster or something like that uh, with HSDS, no, they don't. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward. So this is the easiest way to set up a local version um, of HSDS. And uh, we create a simple uh, configuration with a username and password. And we have an instance running, great. And then we create sort of home directories and double quotes in the HSDS sense. And, and then uh, we, can, we are uh, up and running with HSDS. So we can actually um, create domains as John calls them in HSDS and uh, it looks as if we are interacting with files, and that's why I threw that in here. When you look at uh, that file name, it looks as if it were a local file called home vs code foo.h5, but when I do an ls, the file system tells me, well, there isn't such a thing. Well, there isn't because it's in HSDS. So if I use a direct uh, restful call with curl, for example, uh, then, yeah, you see the information, uh, the HSDS-related information. And here is sort of this is how this is stored locally in the file system in this case. And then uh, the command line tools that come with HSDS and so forth. So all good stuff. And um, then, of course, yeah, the question is, is HSDS really HDF5? And well, my argument would be along the lines of a Turing test where this is the Python script that we used earlier uh, to construct all this. So if I can just rename that module and import this special module H5PyD as H5Py and everything else is unchanged and that thing runs, well, then it probably is HDF5. So let's do it. So we are just creating um, all these uh, trajectories uh, in HSDS. And uh, so now we can run the H5 tools. So like H HSLS, which is the counterpart of H5LS. Um, and it has all the attributes and all the good stuff. And then of course, yeah, we can also take this uh, to the visualization level where we say, hey, um, use the same uh, techniques with matplotlib and so forth. Um, to run against HSDS rather than uh, a native HDF5 file. And then we can also talk about how can I import an HDF5 file uh, into HSDS. Um, I can see this in its imported form. And um, 
see all the attributes and so forth. And then, of course, the interesting, I want to close the cycle. So I was able to import something into HSDS. Now I want to bring it back out and I want to run a diff on it to convince myself that it's really the same thing. So that's what we are doing here. HSGET um, retrieves a copy and, um, and then we run H5 diff in the local file system on the before and after an H5 diff says, yeah, it's probably the same. <laughs> and okay, so HSDS, and just to show you something non-HDF, um, I don't have time uh, to talk about .NET here. I uh, spent the last clinic, I believe, uh, the, the last clinic I did uh, to talk about pure HDF. Um, Jupyter Notebooks in VS Code actually do support uh, .NET. So here is the .NET program actually very concise to um, create that same HDF5 file and so forth. But what I'm going to show you is um, another contributor uh, that helped me was the author of HDFQL. So for users, for example, that come maybe more from a relational database type background, um, this might be um, what they are looking for. OK, I got to select a kernel here. And uh, so I'm just installing live because th th it's sort of a compromise since this is a pre-built Docker container. Every dependency that you install, not exactly bloats, but adds to the size of that um, Docker container image. And, and in some cases, there might be licensing issues. Uh, we can't, we may or may not be um, uh, in compliance with the license by pre-installing it. So in this case, I'm just fetching the tarball um, from HDFQL and install it. And then um, I'm modifying the C++ example that we had earlier. Instead of using the HDF5C API, I'm using the uh, HDFQL language embedded into C++. So you see anybody who has written code against relational backends and so forth is familiar with this pattern where um, yeah, you, you execute a query, you evaluate an expression, and the expression uh, is actually a query uh, expression. So there's this yeah, create, truncate, use file, uh, create attribute um, of a certain type, and then create these data sets and so forth. So if I run this, um, this just ran um, um, all the things um, that we earlier did in C++ in a few uh, queries um, using HDFQL. And then, well, actually, no, it, it just created that file. And uh, now it ran it, and then you see it created the OU HDFQL H5. And clicking on that, yeah, it just um, uh, fires up um, H5 web, and then we can sort of inspect it and so forth, and it's all great. So um, this was just sort of a whirlwind tour of that tutorial, and I hope the idea comes across is really, I think, what we would like to achieve with this tutorial is really show people the, the breadth and depth um, mm -hmm. of the HDF5 ecosystem, which includes all these great uh, community contributions. And uh, there are obviously uh, a few things missing, so this will never be done. Uh, the next thing would probably be Julia. Um, another one, uh, the R HDF5 module. We also, um, I think the first step is if someone would like to get involved, create a GitHub issue. If, if you think, even if you don't do the work yourself, you think, wouldn't it be great to have this or that um, element uh, highlighted? Just create a GitHub issue and uh, uh, all, the, all the people who are interested in this tutorial will look at it and uh, have a discussion, and um, if it's if the consensus is it's worth doing, we'll definitely do it over time. So the emphasis is on. I personally believe this is a very nice format um, to present this and uh, to host this because yeah, it's zero installation. Of course, if you have a local version of Visual Studio Code installed on your desktop, you can actually communicate. Um, with these code spaces on GitHub uh, directly from your local instance. So it's like 
SSHing um, into a Docker container if you have Docker running locally or Docker running somewhere else. But in the in the worst case, all you need is a browser and a GitHub account, and I think those are um, pretty minimal requirements. And then, of course, um, you can in this uh, Dev container. So the uh, configuration I spoke about earlier. So here, for example, this is the Docker file. You can um, use this to do a, a, a create a Docker image on your local machine. And likewise, um, the Visual Studio Code extensions, the ones that are pre-installed, are listed here. And so you can really, if you don't like this, you, you say, I don't have a GitHub account, I don't want a GitHub account, that's fine. Uh, just clone the repo and do your local setup. There are a few modifications you will have to make here and there. For example, um, in the HSDS case, for example, the home directory uh, right now is hard coded. It's home VS code. So in your local installation, that might be different and so forth. But um, yeah, it's, it's not insurmountable. Or, uh, I mean, if there is a a clever person out there that can help us to further modu modularize this and then sort of factor out some of these configuration elements, that would be a great community contribution. I mean, there is, is only so much time uh, everybody can spend on this. And if everybody just sort of chips in with their particular piece of expertise, uh, then um, that would be great. Okay, and I'm going to shut up. I'm almost out of time questions. Hey, Gerd, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Hey, this is super. I, I, uh, this is great. I mean, I'm pretty amazed with all the, uh, different use cases you're covering here. I wanted to ask one quick thing. Any reason HDF view is not part of this con Sorry, any, any reason HDFU is not part of this container that you've created? Yes, uh, the problem, uh, I mean, I think this would be okay um, in a local installation where you have sort of a GUI. Remember that HDFU um, cannot run in a browser. You need some kind of either an X server or um, ah, okay. something like that. Okay. And so it would work in a local installation. However, in a in a browser-based setting, unfortunately, not yet. Okay. All right. That yeah. makes sense. All right. Well, look, thanks for um, all the work everybody's put into this. I, it's it's way cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, other questions? No. Uh, yeah. So I hope. I mean, we have already. If we look at the GitHub repo, so I think Julia is definitely. Um, one of the next um, ticket items, but then also things like the read-only um, S3 um, VFD, um, I think is a is a perfect candidate um, to be included here. Actually, yeah, let me go. Um, so yeah, the first thing I think is just create a GitHub issue. If you have an idea or also a suggestion and say something else would make a much better, much better model problem by all means, uh, uh, put create an issue here, and then the people who are interested in it will pick it up, and uh, we can have a discussion. But yeah, I think this is what what I wanted to get across is really now this is on an evolutionary path where it's not in the past it used to be this person's PowerPoint deck and that other person liked LaTeX and they used this, and then you had a gazillion of different tutorials that were kind of evolutionary dead ends. And they were not interactive to begin with and required a certain setup. And then there was separate code and various here. It's, yeah, do it on your own time. Do it in a more sort of classroom type setting and no installation required if so need be. Real and, quick, mm -hmm. uh, this sort of multidimensional feature space that I think you're you're starting a, a sort of um, walkthrough in some sense here, um, would it make sense to have almost a diagrammatic uh, version of that where people, you know, they want to, they, they, maybe they see on that diagram, well, I want to get over here to where I'm doing scalable, I don't know, um, 
partial IO with compression filters. And so they, they see on this in this diagram that, oh, that's way down in the lower right corner. So I have to kind of walk through the tutorial space, you know, if you will, in this way. Um, because the reason I'm mentioning that is the feature space, as we've observed, is quite uh, high dimensional and quite deep in some areas. And so something that would aid in that would be potentially useful. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, there, there are certain limitations to what you can put on the GitHub README. Um, but then I've seen people have been very creative with designing that front end or that entry point. And yeah, yeah, it may actually go well beyond the tutorial at some point, or the tutorial may be only the, a small portion of this where pretty much, yeah, with any new feature we introduce or even past features, um, just include an example in here and show people how to use it and they can run it right in the browser and then they can make up their mind and say, yeah, this is useful. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Garrett, uh, what about a notebook with the rest of all? Any merit? Uh, believe it or not, there is one. <laughs> oh, okay. There is already one. Actually, my colleague, uh, Matt, uh, created that. And um, it's here. I'm just showing my uh, my incompetency. Uh, no, uh, it's here. And uh, so he gave that presentation. It's just the, the problem with the rest wall is, and I'm glossing over that, is unfortunately I showed you this is the, the default installation of one of HDF5 here is 1106. But of course, there was no wall in uh, 1106. It came in 112, and the, 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 the real deal is 114. So what we have to do is we have to build. Uh, 114 at least library and uh, since the rest wall is a plugin uh, that you add dynamically that also has to be built and i have sort of the build command here the truth is this runs about i think three minutes depending on what kind of instance type you have to build the hdf5 library to build the uh, rest wall connector plugin and then yeah the example is here um uh, this is actually Matt's example, but now I'm actually stunned because uh, this is actually, see, I uh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, I should have done a git fetch uh, before showing you this uh, because um, I have updated that example. So, uh, no, if I open this again... Uh... Mm, I, maybe I didn't do the fetch right. But yes, so long story short, there is an example. Um, uh, uh, there is an example um, of uh, how to use the rest wall. And um, I just can't, because this is the slightly outdated uh, C version. Uh, oh yeah, maybe that, that, mm, okay, sorry, I'm um, typical live demo effect, but there is an example, actually, let me show you um, on the web page. Um, uh, if I go back here, um, uh, um, if you look here, this is this example, lib HDF5 to HSDS, and GitHub does sort of a reasonable job of rendering it. So there is a little bit of boilerplate here. And there is actually a build script. So this will change. I just hacked that together. And this is the example. Yeah, we take the existing C++ example and pretty much modify it by adding the rest in it. And I think I say that here in the comment. You need exactly five changes to make it work. Uh, with the rest wall. You have to initialize the rest wall connector, you have to terminate it, and then basically add a file access property list and add that file access property list uh, as an argument uh, to the create. And that's it. The rest of the code is completely unchanged. And then you compile it. Of course, yeah, you need a running HSDS instance, which we have at this point, and that just works. And then Matt also wrote an example of uh, how to actually use um, multi data set IO. Um, this, this is the multi data set IO example. And so it's there. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, okay. Very good. Excellent. That's good. Check it out. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. Thanks. I'm afraid I have to run to my next meeting. Thank you for coming and, and yeah, tell your friends and we are looking for um, people who want to help to take this to the next level. And um, yeah. Thank right. you. Thanks, Garrett. See you yeah. everyone next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks.